Open up your Bibles today, please, with me to the book of Luke 18. Luke 18. Who believe they're going to get something from God today? That's going to change your life. Amen. We change our lives through faith. Luke 18 and 8. I mean, to see that take place, that was nothing short of than miraculous. The man is turning a whole franchise over to a man. And all he charged, really, <coughs> the price he charged, excuse me, <clears throat> the price he's charging is the same price that you all probably have to pay to get one restaurant. He's turning the whole franchise over to him. Amen. The whole thing. And then say, I'll come and help set him up for you wherever you set him up at for a while I continue to do that. And uh, there's none in, in the Carolinas at all, north of South Carolina. So, I mean, God is doing great things. He said the wealth of the sinners are laid up for the just. And God is causing wealth transfer to come to believers in this hour on another level. Somebody ought to praise him right now. That's why we got to be in position. We got to be in position so the Lord can do these things for us because he want to. Amen. God has a desire to do some things for us that the world will be in awe of as we yield to him and allow him. All right, my heart's been stirred to talk to you today on a subject, and I believe that it's going to minister to you. First, let, let's do this here because I've been teaching on kingdom mindset. And let's uh, look at Matthew chapter 6 first. Then we're going to come back to Luke 18. Everybody in here today going to get something from Jesus. Everybody in the house is going to get something from Jesus. Jesus will say something to your heart to make your life better. Hallelujah. Matthew 6. I like to go, I like to go from one series into another or from one message into another. And so this will help me do that. And let's look at verse 20. Uh, let's look at Matthew 6 and uh, let's look at verse 24. You have it? Matthew 6, 24. I'm reading out of the New King James. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Now, you know, I did a whole teaching on the soul, so the word. And we found out on those last, uh, on the last thing that the devil used to steal the word out of our hearts was worrying about tomorrow. Worrying about tomorrow's. And the cares of this life or the necessities of life. Is that right? Huh? And then the deceitfulness of riches. And the lust for other things. Okay? So we can say the, the worrying about tomorrow, making money, and inordinate desires. is how he choked the word out of people who got the word. And the Bible says as a result of that, people are living, people who are born again, know Jesus as Lord, but they're living what we have been addressing, a fruitless life. In other words, the only evidence that God is getting from us in some cases is that you do show up on Sunday sometime. But outside of the four walls, no one can tell that God is really in your life because your life is not produ producing any fruit. Now, that, that, that's, that's not an indictment, but it's certainly something we need to address because we want to go from fruitlessness to fruit bearing. 
and the result of the fruit is 30-fold, 60-fold, and a hundredfold return. This Bible, this word you got in your hand, has the ability to give you 100-fold results from the word that you take inside of your heart. That means no matter where life have brought you as a, as a person, this word will turn it around and guide you into God's best for your life. So we're talking about living a life bearing fruit. And that bearing fruit is not just natural things only, though God is providing that because in this chapter, that was the primary thing he addressed. He talked about clothes, people who worry about clothes, what I'm gonna wear, what I'm gonna drive, where I'm gonna live, what I'm gonna eat, where is the beef? Yeah. The Lord, the, but Jesus said something. I thought it was powerful. He said, your heavenly father know what things you have need of. What things? That's for people who think God ain't interested in taking care of your necessity. Jesus thought different. He said, he know what things you have need of. Listen, before you ask for it. Which is, the implication is, there's a place with him that you don't have to ask for what you need no more. Oh, I ain't getting but one witness. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> I ain't getting but one witness there. But let me help some people out because the devil is a liar. And the father of all lies. And nothing he likes to lie to you about more than God and his relationship with you and what you mean to him. That's why we can't let Satan and this society or the world at large interpret to you who God is in your life and what God want to do for you. Your heavenly father know what things you have need of before you. He know you need a job. He know you need gang for employment. He know you need good transportation, something you don't have to pray over before you try to get in and go somewhere. Talk to me in here. Huh? And he know you need gas in that tank. You ain't got to be praying about gas. Because your father know what you need before you ask. Somebody lift your hand. <laughs> Thank God right now, because you look like you're interested in what I'm talking about. He know what you need before you ask. But then he said something. It's challenging us, ain't it? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now I'm coming from that lesson, but I'm going to talk to you today about out of that same lesson, have your faith been misplaced? Ask somebody close to you that question for me. Uh -huh. Ask somebody else the same question. Have your faith been misplaced? Because Jesus said, when you are worrying over those things, you have a problem called little faith. Your faith is not where it's supposed to be. See, you think you got a job problem. You think you got a money problem. Talk to me. You think you got the problem in the natural, but the problem in origin is a faith problem, which means it's a trust problem, which go further to say it's a relationship problem. You notice when Jesus taught us about God, he didn't tell you to pray to God. He said, your father. Know what you need. He made it personal. He made it intimate. He know what you need before you ask him for it. But seek first. Hallelujah. So when we worry over these necessities or anything really, it's called little of faith or lack of trust. A lack of trust. And we don't want to believe that you can have uh, all these pages in your Bible highlighted. That you can have a stack of CDs. A lot of them Pastor Lockhart name on it. 
that, that you can look, to, look at uh, Christian television and leave that setting and go worry. You can do it. You can leave out of here today after the presence of God will rest on us. And he's going to rest on us much stronger than what we sense right now. Because he watched over his word to perform. But you can go right out of here and still worry. Anxiety. Are you listening to me? And worry is such a challenge because it tells God directly, I don't trust you. I know, I know what the Bible say, but I can't trust you with my concerns. Because the things we worry, oh, they only should be concerns. And if it become a care, the Lord Jesus say, cast it on him, for he care for you. And don't cast part of it, give it all to Jesus. Casting all of your cares on him, before he care for you. And the believer shall say. All right. <clears throat> so... We went from uh, the problem there was little faith because that's what Jesus said there in uh, Matthew 6. Where is it at? Matthew 6 and let me give it to you. Uh, verse, uh, <clears throat> verse 30, verse 30, 29. He said, and yet I say unto you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven. Will he not much more clothe you? O ye of what? O ye of little faith. Then Jesus go on to say something else. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we wear? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly father. Your heavenly father. Lift your hand up right now and thank God you have a father in heaven who supplies all your need according to his riches in glory. My father will take care of you. That's what Jesus said. And there's no time zone or no crisis in the land can stop him from being your father. Nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing can. He loved you unconditional. He started this relationship with you. And he's able to keep you from falling. However, he must have your trust in him. That's the only exception that God will not compromise. He don't, listen, he don't just ask you for faith. He must have your faith in order to bless your life. And the believers shall say. Then he gave a story out of that Mark chapter 4. He talked about the seed or the word, how it operates. He said the seed is like a man casting seed into the ground. He rides night and day. He don't know when and he don't know how. For the earth brings forth fruit of itself. First the blade, then the ear, and after that, the full corn in the ear. Now notice what he said. Man, go to bed, go to sleep. He wake up, something has spring forth. He sowed it in one time, but it showed up in another time. And that's the way the word works in the life of the believer. You are, to, you are to walk before the Lord, always expecting something from him to spring forth. Huh? Are you expecting something you have sown to spring forth? He said it's going to do it. Hallelujah. And it happens suddenly. Your job is to expect God. And God's job is to make sure what he say happened the way he said. So I'm declaring there's some springing forth suddenly. Things you've been anticipating, things you've been laboring with, things you've been standing in faith, trusting God, they will spring forth suddenly. Somebody ought to thank them. I'm telling you. Yes. 
Yes. My, my, my. Lord Jesus. I see it happening while I say it. I'm seeing these things happening for people while I'm saying it over you. That there are going to be things that spring forth suddenly. You may have forgotten about the good seeds you have sown. But God never forget about a good seed based on the word. Time and seasons are in his hands. And he make all things beautiful in his own time. And I'm telling you, it's spring and forth time. You won't know when and you don't know how, but it just happened because God said so. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Joe, you receiving that. Amen. That's right. And you watch and see how the spring and forth do your life. Listen. Now, I gave you that revelation before that happened to Pastor Bell, but that was a spring forth. Same night, Sunday morning, he released a seed. By that night, he get a text saying, I don't want to do this. I don't even know why I'm doing it. But God have told me to make this happen to you because you've been praying for him to make this happen. That's springing for. I wish there was two believers in here that I came here today for that believe that God is going to cause some things to spring for. You won't know when and you don't know how. That means you ain't got this map, but God is working it. God is working it. God, and it may be the healing in your body. See, don't limit that to no one thing. This is a spiritual principle. It'll meet in any area. Somebody been standing for a sickness, for your health. You're going to go to bed and get up. No pain. No symptoms. No ache. Why? It have spring forth. Somebody lift them hand, praise God, just for a minute. Listen, don't worry about who besides you. You praising God for yourself. It's something you want from him. You something you will going to receive from him. I wish to God people quit coming to church for entertainment and start coming to get something from God. We ain't here just because we ain't got nothing else to do. We are here to receive from him. Somebody been under oppression for months and months and months. That oppression is leaving you. Why? Your peace is springing forth. See, I just got that. That's how you do. You yield to the Holy Ghost and you start taking your father in it. It went from just the material. Now people who need emotional strength is springing for emotional strength is springing for. Somebody been in a real battle for peace. Your peace is being released. It's springing for. I say it's springing <laughs> Yes. You know, let's quit fronting in the church. That, you know, we know you may have it all going on in one area, but if you need something, go ahead and let God give it to you. Don't be worried. Don't be man conscious. Be God conscious. Don't worry about who looking, who ain't looking. The Lord is bringing you something. I know exactly where I'm going. Hallelujah. Who that say I can't wait till tomorrow? You better act like you can't then. Go ahead on. Who that say I can't wait till tomorrow? <laughs> Go ahead on and bust loose here and give God a good praise if you can't wait till tomorrow. If you can't wait till tomorrow, you better bless him now. For what you want. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. I received this. Yes. He's breaking forth.
Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And the earth bring forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear. I mean, first you don't see nothing. Then all of a sudden you see everything you've been asking for. Hey! See, that's rhema for us, bro. That's rhema word to us. Hallelujah. 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 Holy Ghost minister, man. He ministering to us. I'm receiving myself. I say I'm receiving myself. Yes, indeed. Yes, I am. I'm working on something. I'm receiving that from the Lord. See, his word is what he watch over. And if Jesus said it, he will do it. When, when, when you worrying over the necessities of life, Jesus said it's because you're looking at the wrong thing. You done took your eyes off of your source and you're, let, you're letting your needs drive you. Your heavenly father know what you need. He didn't say your God. He said your daddy know what you need before you ask him. Don't get mad at me. I got a daddy in heaven. And he said, even if your earthly father forsake you, I'll never leave you. I'll never abandon you. I'll never let you be without. What a mighty God. Somebody ought to praise him. What a mighty God. Hey, we serve. I'm telling you, he's a bad man. He said, I got you before you ask for it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's get on into the rest of this lesson now. We done bless you by the gift. Let's get into the word on another level. Luke 18 and 8. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Somebody leaving out of here saying, I got just what I wanted from God today. Yes, yes, I know God can, can meet your need right where you're at. Your promotion, your increase. You know, folks be saying that, but God is wrapping you up with it. Right now today, you in the right place today, your footsteps was ordered by the Lord. Timing is in God's hand. And he ordered your steps. You got Luke 18. <laughs> Some of you do. Hallelujah. Y'all don't hear them get it. I'm going to join some of these folks that's having a good time in here. <laughs> we bring your attention to verse 8 of that particular book. We all know this, this story, very familiar story that Jesus told. He began by saying, man ought to always pray and never faint. So the Lord has said, no matter what, if I'm in your life, you should never give up hope. You should never give up hope if you're a Christian. Because Peter said you have a lively hope. Ungodly people have a dead hope, but our hope is alive. Why? Because it's born of the Holy Spirit. 
He have breathed life into our expectation and hope that in nothing we will be ashamed. But with all boldness, we'll declare Christ live in our lives. That's a different hope, ain't it? And the Bible said in Romans 5, this hope make it not ashamed. So there's a hope that you put in God that the, the Lord said at the end of the day when the dust settles, you won't be shamed for trusting me. You will not be shamed for trusting me. Now it can appear, but he'll change it. So when, it, when the story was concluded about this woman who was a widow woman, of course we know about the judge who didn't want to give her a right, she persevered to finally. The Bible said, Jesus said, hear what the unjust judge said. Shall not God avenge his own elect? Though he tarry, yet he will answer them speedily. In other words, what, is, what is he saying? Though it look like God ain't coming through for you, but if a judge who was not right came through for a woman, how much more will I come through for my children? It's what Jesus was saying about the father. How much more? An ungodly man turned his, uh, his mind and attitude to help a woman he didn't want to help. How much more our father will always be a present help when me and you need him. Then he said, nevertheless, when the son of man come, will he find faith in all the earth? Now, what a question for Jesus to ask, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. He said, when he come, will he find faith? Now, why will he ask that? He understood the times we would be living in, in this time of 2015. The latter days, we are in the latter days. How I many you believe it? Well, you don't believe it. You're still in the latter days. <laughs> All the signs now in society tell you, you are living in last times. Amen. But now the path of the just is as a shining light. It's getting brighter and brighter for the church and for the believer. So we're not a part of the problem. We are a part of the answer and the solution. That's why many in the church got to change their mind about God. You were never born again to be a part of the problems of your society. God called me and you to be answers to the problems and the crisis that are in our land. Talk to me. And so he said, will he find faith? Because he understands something about Satan. He understood that Satan will do all he can to destroy faith in people's hearts. He is the chief destroyer of faith in the hearts of the believer. Now, what he used, that's another thing. But you better know he's behind it when it comes against your faith. Now, the next thing you need to know about the devil, what he can't destroy, he will try to cause you to be put in a position where you will begin to misplace your faith. It ain't destroyed, but you got it, but all in the wrong place, which might well be like you don't have any faith. Because when Jesus taught faith, turn over there, Mark the 11th chapter and the 22nd verse, he was specific about where faith should go. Hallelujah. Now, you know I'm a faith teacher, so I'm a teacher faith. I'm blessed twofold. I'm blessed to teach it and live it. That makes a difference. So now, if that's right, here's what I want you to get a hold of today. That yes, you know faith and you understand some things about faith, but could it be God can help us today on another level to understand the functioning of our faith? Could he do it? Let's praise him right now that he will do it then. He will do it. Because here's what the devil understands. When, when you go after one faith fight after another faith fight, at some point you got to have your faith renewed strengthen, infuse. When you've been in a faith fight, you don't go somewhere and do nothing. You need to let the Lord himself come and pull back in you what has been drawn out of you. That's happening in the church all the time. We lose virtue, but we don't know how to get back in a place where the Lord can renew the virtue. Faith is a grace. It's a grace from God. You don't just wake up with it. You have to engage it. 
in order for this faith to stay active and alive on the inside of our bosom. Amen. Amen. What did Jesus say over there in Mark the 11th chapter in the 22nd verse? What did he say? Jesus said, have faith in God. Have faith in God. So he told us that we need to put our faith in him. Say that with me. Put my faith in him. Yeah, have faith in God. Now, that's different. That ain't, that ain't a principle there as such. Uh, that ain't putting your faith in a what, but in him. That's different. Have faith in him. Now, let's talk about this for a moment because we want to see some things that will help us. Turn now with me to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 12 and 13 of that particular book. Mis we are addressing today misplaced faith. See, some people's faith ain't working because it's misplaced. Huh? You got it, but it ain't in the right place. <laughs> huh? Listen what the Apostle Paul said. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12 of that book. Hallelujah to Jesus. Listen what it says. He said, for this reason, I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I believe, and am persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. What did he say? I know, watch this, in whom I believe. He didn't say that I know what I believe. He said I know in whom I'm believing. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Then he goes on to say to us, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Paul said, let me be an example to you. You're to hold fast. Follow me as a pattern, he said. And hold fast. But he said, hold fast in faith and in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's critical for faith to function because this faith me and you have, it works by love. Is that right? Faith which worketh by love. So one of, the, one of the prerequisites to have a faith that get results from God, you have to come to a place where you mature in your walk in Christ Jesus. What is the mature walk in Christ Jesus? You're learning to walk the love walk. And you learn to talk the love talk. I say you're walking the love walk and you're talking the love talk. And your faith have to have that as a foundation or it won't work. So you got a lot of people who is mean as the day is long, hateful as they can be, and yet they call themselves people of faith. You will have to grow up in Jesus and walking in love means you have to put up with some things you don't want to put up with. Listen to me. You have to endure some things you don't want to endure. Oh, can I get some help in here? You're going to have to forgive some things you don't want to forgive. Listen to me. You'll have to hold your tongue in your head when it's trying to come out to say everything. I need some help in this place. I need some help. You don't learn how to do none of that. You ain't walking in love. Paul said, let me be an example to you. And he, and he gave his life as a picture. Look what all I went through. And people have forsaken me and abandoned me, he said. And I had to turn around and rely on the Lord. That's why he said, but I believed in him. I trust him. Yes. And, I, and I'm persuaded 
That is faith, ain't it? Because faith is persuasion. Abraham was fully persuaded that what God said, he could do it. And that's when you're really getting in faith because you're persuaded about something without the evidence of it. Let me go on because I see you taking some good notes today. So what's the next thing we see then? Jesus said, have faith. Come on, say it with me. Have faith in God. Come on, say it three times. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Give him praise. Your faith is in God. Now then, if that's so, Romans 1 and 17 tell us something. Come on, stay with me now. You know I don't touch your faith, but I know where I'm going. <laughs> Romans 1 and 17 tell us something, don't it? It said that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. That's right, Brother Larry. The just shall live what? By faith. By faith. So then faith comes from being Somebody better listen to me today because everybody ain't going to get this, but God got you here to get it. So faith going to go from being a crisis uh, uh, management to an empowerment. I ain't, I ain't using my faith just when I'm in trouble. I'm using my faith now because I'm called to live a new way. This is the Jesus way. This world ain't going to understand me. They're going to talk about me. They're going to say everything. They can call me all kind of names. I don't care because I'm going to Jesus' way. And as long as he's with me, who can be against me? So he said, don't wait till you're in a crisis to try to use your faith. It won't work because you ain't developed yourself to understand the function of it. It was never designed to be a parachute that bailed you out of the crisis of life. It was called to be an empowerment force that first and foremost give you access to the living God. Not a dead God, the living God. There's some folks still arguing about is Jesus who he said he is. He's alive forevermore. He will never die again. So that's why he said the just shall live by faith. It's the way we live. It's the new way I live. Lift your head up and say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Faith, was to faith was given to me for a whole new way to live. Second Corinthians 5 and 7 say, for we walk by faith and not by our sight. So faith now is given to me that I can see beyond what my senses have been trained to locate. I got a sense that reach into another realm. It's the sixth sense of my spirit now. It's my faith and I'm to walk by it. So we walk by faith. And not by sight. Where faith become a walk is where God himself began to walk with me. Now a lot of folks want people to walk with them, but who want God to walk with you? If you want God to take a walk with you, you have to walk by faith. Which means if God walk with you, he will help you on life's journey. He will help you no matter how the journey of life presents itself. God will help you in each section of life. Every intersection, he'll know which way you're supposed to go. Every tight place, he'll tell you how to come through it. Because God is walking with you. We walk by faith, not by sight. Lift your hand and thank him for your new walk with God. Go ahead on and thank him. Because this will, this will change things in your life. Hmm? Now, 
Why is this faith so important? Here's the next thing I want to say to you. Because to be, how many of you believe that when God put you in this earth, he had something specific in mind for you? How many of you believe that? That everybody has a unique, specific calling, purpose, whether if it wasn't nothing to be a mama, a daddy, you, you still call the beat. You got it? So to be what God called you to be and to finish what he gave you to do, you will need faith to do it. What I just say, to be what God called you to be and to finish it, what God called you to finish, you will need faith to do it. It will require faith. It will require faith. Say that with me. To be what God called me to be, to do what God called me to do, will require faith to finish it. Now, how do I know that? Paul said over there in 2 Timothy, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Now I'm ready. I'm ready to meet him. Why? Faith have empowered me to do what I was called to do, to be what I was called to be, and to finish it. You do know there are some places in life that if you don't have God to help you, you won't have no help. There are some areas you will have while you're alive that nobody shorter than a living God can help you. But that's what faith is all about. God said, I'll be there when you need me. So he said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith and now I'm ready. That's 2 Timothy 4 and 7. He said, now I'm ready to be offered up. Can you imagine? Somebody knew they were getting ready to get their head cut off, and he said, I'm ready to lose my head now. Why? Because faith have empowered me to finish my course, to keep my assignment. Irregardless, I've kept it. <laughs> I'm ready. What a way to live. I say, what a way to live. Then that brings me to a question that I want to ask all of us today. Why is the teaching of faith so difficult? And why is it fought so hard? Why is it so difficult? And why is it fought so hard? Why understanding faith is so difficult? And why is it fought so hard? First thing we want to give you is Hebrews 11 and 6. Hebrews 11 and 6 say, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. Anytime something connects you to God, it comes under warfare. Anytime. If God is linked to you in any way, warfare will surround it. And faith connects you to God. That's why Hebrews 11 and 6 say, but without faith. Huh? Now, you can be without a lot of other things, but when it comes to God, you can't be without faith. Because he said, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Who want to please God? I do. Who want God to think well of you? I do. I want the one who could, could, got all power in his hands, certainly, to be my friend. I want the one who said, the, the earth belonged to me and the fullness thereof, the worlds and everything in it, I want him as a friend. Huh? Your mama didn't raise no fool either, did I can see it. No, I want him as my friend. Well, he said, then, if you want me involved in your life, it's a way you please me. And without this missing ingredient, nothing else you offer will matter. Nothing else will ever make a difference if you don't bring this to the table. Can't you see why it's so difficult now? Look at the weight it carry. God says the only way to please. It. More than that, listen what uh, Ephesians 2 and 8 say. For by grace you are saved through faith. 
that not of yourself is a gift from God. Meaning, I don't care if everybody in your family was saved when you was born, you won't get it that way. Because you can't inherit salvation. You must exercise faith in God who only alone can save you. And he will give you what money can't buy, what you can't inherit, what you can't work for to get, but faith will deliver it. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I love Jesus. Faith will deliver it to you. Mm. Some of you shouldn't doubt God about anything. Because you know what a mess you was before you got saved. And if he could save you in all that quagmire mess, what he can't do? I mean, think about it. If he could bring you in, you know you was a basket case. And he brought you in. Then what he can't do for you if you exercise faith? Huh? So the, the, the first and foremost, it takes faith to please God. For the Bible says, without it, you can't please him. For he that come to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. Oh, faith will bring some rewards to you that you know you didn't deserve. You will be asking, just, God, why are you doing this for me? God, I didn't know you liked me like this. You'll start asking yourself that. Huh? You are, you are, you are ask and answer yourself. You know what they call that. <laughs> Somebody be ready to take you to the mountains. They catch you doing that one. God, why are you doing this for me? He said, simply because you got faith in me. Just simply because you got faith in me. And I'm looking for people who will just put faith in me. And don't allow this world and society and the gurus talk shows cause you to get twisted up in your mind and head and make something that God made so simple, so complicated. Let no man spoil the simplicity of Christ. When you start making it complex, you know God done left it. Because he said, I made it where a wayward man can get it. Modern day vernacular, I made it where a fool can't miss it if he look for it. So no wonder he said in the scriptures, I was found of them who sought me not. What does that mean? God came after you. And he got you. Because he wanted you. <laughs> yes he came for you because he wanted you why is faith so difficult why is it why is it so difficult let's 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 look at a couple of things number one logic and reasoning makes it difficult to practice faith. Come on, stay with me now, because I got something I got to give you here. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 11 and 3, if we'll go there, please. 2 Corinthians 11 and 3. Because logic and reasoning, that's what make it difficult, right? Huh? The way we process things, our understanding, can make it difficult for you to put your faith in God. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Who have it? Listen what he said. For I fear, but I fear, least somehow as the serpent deceive Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupt. Corrupt minds? From the simplicity that is in Christ or from the simpleness about Christ, right? As the serpent beguiled, 
or deceived or seduced, pulled her away from truth and corrupt her mind with a lie. Huh? What did he, what did he tell the woman? Did God really mean that? God couldn't really mean that. So what are you saying? Can you really be blessed by following God? Can you just get saved by saying some words? Can you really be healed when you believe Jesus bought stripes for you? That's too simple. Huh? But that's how it works. And we're told let no man spoil the simplicity of Christ. And how he does that, he corrupts your mind, telling you it can't be that simple. That's too simple. Right? So... One of the major problems we're living in, a time where people now have made their opinion on par with God's word. Don't help me there. I don't need any. Because people believe just because you got an opinion, that makes it fine authority. You got it? What do you think about it? Uh-huh. Now, what do you think about it? Uh-huh. Okay, now, what you got to say about it? And everybody's saying they're right. Everybody can't be right. There's got to be a wrong, and there's got to be a right. Then that means somebody got to be qualified to set the standard of what is right and what is wrong. It don't make it right because you like it or wrong because you disagree with it. Huh? I lost some of you there, but I'm going to stay with you anyhow. So then that means what Paul prophesied, what Jesus prophesied is coming to pass. In the last days, men would be heady and high minded. You cannot get the things of God by the mind. Neither can you interpret it by the mind. Huh? The Bible says the natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned or spiritually revealed. They are unfolded by a spiritual grace, not by logic and not by reasoning. The more you try to reason the things of God, the more you try to use logic on it, the more it will talk you out of faith. Come on, I'm going to invite you to stand for a moment. Then I'm going to have you sit back down and we'll try to wrap it up. Come on, give him some praise, somebody. Come on, thank him. A lot of word, a lot of teaching, ain't it? Hallelujah. Come on, bless the Lord just for a moment. Hallelujah. Listen to me. These are one of the truths you have to get to change your life. Amen. You may be seated. I'm taking time with you because I know you need this. I, nah, nah, it's a, there's some things you want, then there's some things you need. Trust me, what God got me talking to you about today, you need it. And you're going to need it more in the days to come than you do right now while you're sitting here. So we got to get these things, right? We got to get them. There you go. Praise God. Hallelujah. So the Bible said, let no one spoil the simplicity of Christ. Amen. Logic and reasoning cannot tap into the things of the spirit. You can't locate God by logic. You can't locate God by rationale and reasoning. You follow me? And when you're called to live by faith, you have to allow the, the, the spirit of faith on your heart and in your life take precedent over logic and reasoning. You can't do that except you got a relationship with God and his word. Now, let me go on a little further here because I want to put this, at least this be recorded for you where you can go back and listen to it. All right. Now, then if that be so. All right. Uh, when then when then. Satan corrupts the mind or attack people with logic and reason. What is the end result of that every time? Confusion. Confusion is will be right there present where where he don't want you to understand faith. 
He wants you to be confused about it. I can't understand that. You, can, you got to be able to understand it because God gave it. And he ain't going to give you nothing to make you confused. It's the interpretation and your perception that bring confusion and who else you letting talk to you about the things of God. There are some people you got to shut out your ears. You say, why? They don't qualify to get in your ears. <laughs> Hallelujah. They ain't accomplished nothing. They ain't did nothing. They, ain't made, they ever made anything happen. So how are they going to tell you how to manage your life when they're out of control? And that's where logic and reason and all that kind of stuff come from. Huh? I want to wear that one out, but I got to go on here. Come on, give me some up here. <laughs> all right? So let's, let's, let's see something here. So then if that be so, then the next thing we need to see is uh, uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, you write this for scripture reference. You don't, don't have to go there. I kind of quoted it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. The Bible, they'll say, God, take the, the, the wisdom of man and, and make it foolishness. The, wi the wisest of man is but foolishness to God. So that means there's nothing this society or this world can teach God. Amen. There is no teacher for God. So you ain't listening to a good teacher when you hear his word. You're listening to the teacher. The instructor of life. So don't check up with what a talk show think about it. Listen, who got knowledge but no spirituality? I, listen, don't be fooled by it and say, I'm a Christian. Most of them be saying that they may have got a drop of water on them. But you'll never know it. No, I'm serious. See, we got to watch what we feed ourselves on. The devil wants you confused. If he can't stop faith in you, he wants you to misplace it. Put it where it don't belong. So you people who sound intelligent. And how many of you know God ain't got nothing against intelligence? He gave them the brains. But the brain of a man will never be superior to the word of the living God. God don't just have knowledge. He is the wise God. Wisdom was there with him at creation. What is wisdom? Application of information. I don't just know it. I know how to do what I know. I can implement what I'm learning. And that's what's wrong in the church. People just learning and learning and learning and they don't implement what they learn. That's called hearers only. Huh? You don't watch it. You become a, 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 a sermon junkie. You just want to hear the latest one. But you ain't doing nothing with any of them you heard before that. You don't like me, but I'm here not to get like. I'm here to tell you what the Lord is saying. Now, then if that is the case, then we see the Bible say God is not the author of confusion. So who write talk shows or this Bible? Let's just bring it to the road. Who write talk shows or God? then we better start acting like it as the church of the living God. Amen. All right. So then, what's the next thing we need to understand? The Bible tells us in, in 2 Corinthians 14 that the non-spiritual person can't know the way of faith and they can't know the way of God, not by being a non-spiritual person. You can be the most intelligent person it is. The Bible said that Christ was a stumbling block to the Jews. Huh? And foolish to the Gentiles or the Greeks. Why? Because the Greek was all about philosophy. Huh? The, 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 the wise sages came out of, out of that culture, the men of mine. So when Jesus came with his message, Paul said they couldn't receive it because their head wouldn't let them get it. 
they couldn't come with a logic and a reason how a man could say, I'm going to die for you and then turn around and save you. And by my blood, I'll wash you. <laughs> then fill you with my very present in life. And the Jews say, no way he could be the, the Messiah. So they stuck. They're all right when you talk about Moses. They're all right if you talk about Abraham. When you say Jesus to a Jew, they stumble. Yet he was the Jew. He was the Jew among Jews. Talk to me, somebody. <laughs> but they couldn't believe the Messiah would come and be born in the ghetto of, Jer of, of Israel, Nazareth, the dirtiest town of the whole country is where Jesus came from. That's why one of them said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That's the way some folks feel about your home, your house, your family. How can anybody come out of that family and be good? Because God will make you good. God will make you blessed. So they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Today we'll be saying, Jesus of the ghetto. So he came to his own. And his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Then the Bible said God will take the foolish things to confound the mighty, the weak things to bring the base to nothing, or bring the high things to base. So what he said, I'll take people like you and send you to people who say, no way you could tell me about God. No way God can be using you. That don't jive. You can't get that to come together. If he was going to pick somebody, it wouldn't be you. And God say, that's my foolishness that bounds the wise. I'll use what I want to use. How I want to use it. The way I want to use it. Listen to this. Then, then qualified, disqualified people. You were disqualified by your society and God turned around and qualified you. Oh yeah, you ought to praise him right there because I'm talking about you. If you don't know it, tell your neighbor. See, he's talking about you right now. He is talking about you. All right, let me wind this up. Let me wind this up. Lord, help me here. Deuteronomy 32 and 20 tells us something. Watch this. I want to give you a working definition for faith. See, I haven't talked about it a lot. I didn't even tell you what our definition of it is. Because, see, you could think faith is one thing, and the Bible may be telling you something else. Give me some help. But what I found was the Hebrew and the Greek, which the Bible was written in, both was consistent in what they said faith is. Now, ever from the Hebrew writer, we, we get the uh, 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 faith uh, being trusting, trusting. And then it goes on to trustworthiness. Then the Greek give a whole nother spin. Greek say it's confidence. When you say you got faith, it's saying you got confidence. When you say you got faith, it's saying you got trust. When you saying you got faith, you saying my trust it's in someone who's worthy of it. You have given it over because he has proven himself to be worthy of your confidence in him. Could you say that about God? Then also it said persuasion. And then it means moral conviction. Is that right? Now, <laughs> the Bible said, God said, I'm going to turn my back on them. I'm going to see what they end going to be. Deuteronomy 32 and 20, he said there are children who are disobedient, who have no faith. That's what he said about the children of Israel in the Old Testament. You don't hear me. Huh? He said, I'm going to turn my back on them because why? He said, they don't have no trust in me. You got that? You see that? Huh? Then, if that's so, now that I done told you what faith is, I said to you, 
if you if you take that definition, then what what we get out of that, you know, that cause it, it speaks of firmness, stability. Right. Uh, you get out of that confidence, persuasion, moral conviction, trusting. Then all of that talk about foundation. Right. Something I can build from. So true faith is something you can be alone. I say true faith is something you can be alone. Then if that be so, what are the, I say, if you, I ask you today, is your faith misplaced? Where are some places you can misplace your faith? Here's where we talk to you for a minute, because this is how the Lord wants us to understand this. Number one, I'm going to deal with things that you just say, no, wait, wait a minute, Pastor Holt. Number one, is your faith just in your family? Because here's some people say, if a family just stick together, they can come through anything. Cain and Abel didn't know it. Because the first murder on record was a family member killing another one. Because of worship. He just didn't like the way his brother worship was turning out and he just didn't match up with it. And he hit him in his head and killed him. So the family that stick together can come through anything. Huh? Listen, listen. A family that stick together can come through anything if God is at the head of that family. Now, am I, and I'm going to say quite a few other things. Am I saying it's wrong to have your faith in your family? Of course not. But you can't have it ultimately only in the family. And that's what some people today put everything in family. I'm pro-family. But I understand there's a limitation that the best of us can't do no more than what we can do. So is your faith just in family only? It can be there and you don't know it. What about prayer? Huh? I'm stirring up some stuff now. Ain't I? See, y'all wanted me to quit. I'm too late. I'm here now. <laughs> what about prayer? What about prayer? Faith in prayer. There are a whole bunch of people praying. They ain't praying to God. Jesus even talked about people who said, profess, I'm talking to God. He said, why are you just saying the same thing over and over and over and over like God can't hear? Repetitious praying. He said, that prayer ain't doing anything. So your faith can't just be in your prayers. No, no, we all can pray, but only God can answer. What about money? Well, I lost everybody in here right there. <laughs> what about money? And yet Ecclesiastes 10, 19 said money answered all things. Yet when Jesus taught about money, he said, watch out for it because it can deceive you. The warning he gave was that people can try to put money in the place where only God can be. So if you don't watch it and the rich young ruler showed us, he was loaded. He was a rich man. Yet when Jesus told him to, to get rid of all his wealth and follow him, the Bible said he was sad at that saying. He chose his wealth over God. And he walked away. He left Jesus. The Bible said he walked off. He had a bunch of money, but the money deceived him. It made him believe that it was more valuable to him than God. Now, as are we teaching poverty? Listen to me. The gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus' public uh, meeting, the first one he did was in a synagogue. The first thing he said out of his mouth when he stood up, opened the books, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He started with the poor first. First public message. The poor was his concern. You don't tell me you're telling a poor person they're going to be better off by I'm just going to feed you. He was telling them you don't have to live poor no more. I'm here. I'm here. I stopped poverty like I stopped sin. Come on, somebody out of praise. Yeah, come on now. Give God some praise. You already listen. I don't care what nobody say unless you got some mental issues. You don't like uh, being po in, in poverty and not having enough. 
I don't care how spiritual you are. Don't tell me you like your pockets empty. And Jesus know that about you. That was his first public message. Everywhere else he preached, treat, preached to individuals. It was there when he stepped in the church, he gave the, 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 the whole list of Isaiah. I'm here to stop the broken heart. No matter what has broken your heart, I'll fix it. I'm here to take away the bruises life has given you. I can take offense out your heart. I know you're offended, but I can stop you from living that way where you can move on from that place you was hurt. Somebody ought to give God some thanksgiving there. That was his first public, public message. Now, then that be case, uh, we can put our faith totally in nothing but doctors. Medicine. Let's be honest. Will really, when you get in pain, you want a doctor. Enough of it. But then if doctors can heal you, why people are still sick in every hospital? Let's just wake up. We're not telling you not to believe in doctors. You ought to believe in a good doctor, especially if you ain't got no faith. You better believe in one. But listen to me. With their best technology, all they can do is diagnose what's going on in you. There's only one person who has the answer to sickness. His name is Jesus, the Christ. And he said, I'll heal you. Let's talk. There's some folks get in trouble. Their only faith is in a lawyer. Only faith they got is in a lawyer. And then you find that the lawyer's on the court docket like <laughs> he in trouble. He couldn't keep himself out of trouble. And all your faith is in the lawyer. But Jesus said, I'll be a lawyer. In the courtroom of life. I'll argue your case. I'll mediate between you and man. I'll be your advocate. Ask your neighbor one more time. Now they're looking at me a little different. Ask them. Say is your faith misplaced? Jesus said, have faith in God. First Peter 1 and 7 said, having gone through trials, your faith has become precious. More precious than gold. Why is faith so important? God said, because it's precious. And it's more precious than gold. Now, faith is only more precious than gold when you see it got you out when you couldn't get out no other way. You don't forget that God, by you trusting him, Made a way when you couldn't see a way. Open a door that was closed on you. Made up for what you lack. He said then faith become precious to you. Somebody say I got the precious thing. It's my faith. Now, why is faith so powerful? Paul said in Galatians 2 and 20, I'm crucified with Christ. We see it's precious. And we also see it's powerful now. He said, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ live in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, the faith that I got that I'm walking by, Jesus took out of himself and put it inside of me. I got some of Jesus' faith in me. That's why faith is powerful. Faith is precious. Listen to me. And it's the most precious thing you will ever have on this earth outside of the Holy Spirit. 
And the devil work overtime that if he can't stop it, he wants you to put it in the wrong place. Either way, you ain't getting off the first base with God if your faith is misplaced. So he said, I'm crucified. This faith I got, God gave it to me to live by it. You think God going to give you something that don't work? Jesus gave that out of himself to you. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I'm stopping, but I sure ain't through. Come on, give us some praise.